Hi, Algebra 1. Welcome. We're jumping into our Saxon Algebra 1, Lesson 28. So I'm really excited about some of the concepts we're going to cover this week in Algebra 1. Um, I think we're getting into some exciting algebra, um, especially with our exponents and solving algebraic equations. So I hope you're excited. Um, I know I sure am. So let's jump right into lesson 28, and it begins on page 116 of your Saxon book. So um, in lesson 21, we're starting with algebraic, um, or excuse me, fractional, um, fractional parts with numbers. So, you know, sometimes in algebra when they introduce fractions, I've seen students start to feel overwhelmed where if it were a whole number, they might not feel as intimidated. So it's really important to just put a plug in that fractions are just another way to write division. Fractions are part of a whole. So um, if you if you have time, I would really encourage you to, to make some flashcards with some three by five cards and just explore some of the fractions that we use on a regular basis. One half is 0.5. And as you become more familiar with those fractions, it makes it much easier to solve problems with fractions in it. So um, some common ones like a fourth, 0.25, 3 fourths, 0.75, I think about quarters. If I have one out of four quarters, I have 0.25 of a dollar, 25 cents. So three fourths would be 75 cents. It's three fourths of a dollar, or three out of four quarters that I need to make a dollar. So 25, 50, 75. So um, just kind of becoming more familiar with fractions so that they're not quite as intimidating for you. So your book is showing you fractional parts of numbers, and it's also showing you functional notation. So uh, the first example that it gives, it says three-fourths of what number is 69? And one thing that I really encourage students to do is rewrite that sentence in a math sentence. So three-fourths of, of just means multiply, and then you can put a variable in for the what number, x. So three-fourths x, is means equals 69. And then just solve it. If you're multiplying times a variable, the inverse operation would be divide by that fraction. Or if you know the fraction, you can com um, convert it to a decimal and solve it that way. So your book is showing you different ways to work with fractions and hopefully not feel quite as intimidated. And then um, functional notation is, is simply a, a way that we write no, notation for uh, functions. So um, especially as you get into upper level math, you're gonna have to write multiple functions. So we, we write that by saying f of x, the function of x. Um, and, and then um, they show you how to write that. So if I simply had an equation y equals x plus seven, I could rewrite that in function notation and say f of x equals x plus seven. So um, we're just saying that y is the function of x. And when you think about that y is always dependent on what we plug in for x. So x is the independent variable, y is the dependent. So that's why we say f of x. Um, your book also shows you, you can say things like g of x, h of x. So functional notation sounds intimidating, but it's actually quite easy. Just replace the Y with uh, whatever your uh, book is asking you to, to name it, F of X, G of X, H of X, or um, whatever. So let's take a look at our practice on page 119 for uh, this lesson. So letter A says on page 119, and again, we're on lesson 28, it says four thirds of what number, and I'm going to abbreviate the number with hashtag, and I, I, that actually uh, is the pound symbol that have, has always uh, meant number, but nowadays we use it for hashtag, right? So four-thirds of what number is 64. Now, if I rewrite this in a math sentence, it's just words right now, but four-thirds times x 
what number, what number is x, is, means equals, 64. Now, I could easily solve that. My goal in algebra is just to get my variable by itself. If it's being multiplied by 4 thirds, I could divide it by 4 thirds. Or if I remember with fractions, division of fractions is simply multiplication of its inverse. And remember that algebra is always fair. What it does to one side, it always has to do to the other. Life's not always fair, but algebra always is, right? So the threes cancel out, fours cancel out because they're opposite, and everything cancels and leaves me with x. That was my goal, to get my variable by itself. So if it's 64 over 1, then what I'm going to do is cross-reduce. 4 goes into 6 one whole time and leaves me with 2. 4 goes into 24 six times. So 4 divided by 4 is 1, and 64 divided by 4 is 16. And then I just have 16 over 1 times 3 over 1, which would be 6 times 3, 18, carry my 1. X equals 48. So 4 thirds of 48 is 64. And always ask yourself, is that reasonable? Well, 4 thirds is larger than 1 whole. So 64 is a third more than 48. So that makes reasonable sense. So always reason out, is this, um, is this realistic? Is this um, accurate, right? Always want to check our answers. Now, um, B is very similar to A because it's three and a fifth of what number? So again, you're multiplying. It's a mixed number, so you're going to make it improper and then still multiply by its reciprocal. So C is set up a little bit different. So let's take a few moments to look at what C looks like. So C is worded totally different, so our setup's going to be different. It says, what fraction, what fraction of 60 is 48? Now, I have seen students before panic when they see this because they think, oh no, how do I set this up? I'm not sure. Well, come down and just rewrite it in a math sentence. And we know how to solve algebraic problems. So rewrite it in the algebraic. What fraction? I don't know what fraction, so I'm going to replace it with a variable x. What fraction or x of 60? Of means multiply. So what fraction of 60 is, is means equals 48. Now, my whole goal in algebra is to get that variable by itself. It's being multiplied by 60, so I'm going to divide it by 60. Well, friends, I just got my fraction. X equals 48 over 60. Now, that's not reduced to lowest terms, so I can reduce it. 4 will go into each of those. 4 into 48 is 12. 4 goes into 6 one time with two left over, and that would be 15. Now, it can reduce again. It can reduce by 3. So, uh, uh, 3 goes into 12 four times. 15 divided by 3 is 5. I could have started out by reducing it by 12. So, um, 12 goes into 48 four times. 60 divided by 12 is 5. So, my final answer, x equals 4 fifths. We found our fraction, 4 fifths of 60 is 48. So it's accurate and we made sure, is that reasonable? 4 fifths is less than a whole. So 48 is less than 60. So that is reasonable. Now, letter E, it says, let, let me erase my board since we wrote very large, so uh, we're not able to see. Now, um, letter uh, D is 4 and a half of uh, 220 is what number? So let me actually set up, I, I was going to skip D, but D is different than C. So it says 4 and a half of 220 of 220 is what number? All right. Now, don't panic. All right. Uh, because even though it's different than what we've set up before, we just have to rewrite it. So four and a half, you can write four and a half. Some of you at home may know that's 4.5. So you can do either. Of means multiply. 220 is means equals what number? 
What number is just a variable? X. <gasps> Friends, this one is nicer than all the others because the variable's already by itself. So if the variable's by itself, just do what it says. Four and a half times 220. So you can take your calculator and do that, or you can make this improper. Four times two is eight, plus one is nine. That'd be nine over two times 220 over one. Two goes into two one time. Two goes into two one time and zero. So it's 110 times 90 equals X. So it would be 990 equals X. So four and a half of 220 is 990. All right, and that makes reasonable sense because four times that would be 880, right? So um, do, do you see how just not letting our, our, our um, words intimidate us, but rewriting it in an algebraic sentence sure does help us know how to solve it. And our goal in algebra is always to get that variable by itself. Now, we were going to skip D, and I, I realized that that was different. So now let's jump back to where we were. We were uh, actually going to solve letter E. So letter E says F of X. Remember, it's function notation. F of X equals X squared minus 3. Find F of negative 1. So all it's telling us here is that that we're needing to solve the equation. F of X just means Y. Y equals X squared minus three. Now it's asking us to use the X. So remember that F of X would go here. So it's saying let X be negative one. So I'm just solving negative one squared minus three. So negative one squared would be negative one times negative one is positive one minus three. So what is it? The f of x or the y equals negative 2. So that's all that we're solving there is we're just plugging this in for x. All right. And the next one has g of x. And it tells us to find it when the g of x and x is 2. So find the function when the x is 2. So you're just plugging in 2 for the x. Now, I have seen it before where it will say where the f of x equals a number, let's say five. Well, that would mean that you replace the whole f of x with five. But when it writes it in this notation, it means let x, because f of x, let x be negative one. So please be aware of those two different types of questions. In this case, it's telling us to plug in the x for negative one. And letter f, plug in the x as two. So I'm gonna let you solve that one at home on your own. So that is lesson 28, my friends. So not too intimidating and um, a few new concepts for you there. So I hope you'll enjoy that lesson this week. Now we're looking at lesson 29 and lesson 29 starts something really exciting. Lesson 29, we jump into negative exponents and zero exponents. Now both of these are extremely important. So uh, we want to make sure that we understand. So if I have, let's say, x to the negative 2, any time that my exponent is negative, I've had students misunderstand and think, well, does that mean that my number value is negative? And no, it actually does not. It's not saying the number value is negative. It's saying its position needs to change. So when it's a negative exponent, that means 1 over x squared. So if we think of it in this terms, the negative exponent means that it needs to flip down into the denominator. So if, if you think of, um, let's, let's just take, for example, 10, right? 10 to the first power is 10, right? And 10 squared is 100, right? That would be here in place value, so it would move this way. But uh, 10 to the 0 is actually, let me, let me move these around so they're under each other, right? So 10 to the zero is actually one, right? So you can see how the place value changes. But 10 to the negative one would actually be 0 0.1. Or another way you could write it is one over 10. 0 0.1 is one over 10. Now, 10 to the negative two, I would flip it down and say one over... Uh, 10 squared, 
or I could say one over a hundred, but it would also be written O1. So that's a neat way to look at place value and see how exponents affect place value, right? Because um, we understand to the first power is itself, but anything to the zero power is simply one. If I write 500 to the zero power, it's one. And you can try that on your calculators at home. Any base to the zero power is one. So um, even if I have a variable, if I say X to the zero power, you can go ahead and just substitute in one for it. So if you're multiplying it or adding it or whatever you're doing after that exponent, you can continue on because any base raised to the zero power is one. Now, so negative exponents, the value is not negative, it's position needs to flip. So let me give you an example. If I had y, let's say I had x over y to the negative 3. So I've got one negative exponent, but it's in the denominator. Well, that just means its position needs to change. If it's in the denominator, then it would flip up to the numerator. So this answer would be x gets to stay the same. He's in the numerator. He's not got a negative exponent, so his position does not change. But y cubed comes up to the numerator because this negative says its position needs to flip from the denominator to the numerator. Now, nothing moved down to the denominator, so I could just write over 1, or I could just keep it all as a whole number, x, y, cubed. So that's just an interesting way to look at negative exponents. Now, in algebra, it's not proper to leave an answer with a negative exponent unless it's scientific notation. You can't change um, if it's a super small number to a, to a large. So scientific notation is one time that it's okay to leave a negative exponents or if the directions say you can. But otherwise, it's proper to, to flip it either to the numerator or denominator to make it a positive exponent. So uh, those are just uh, proper things we do in algebra. So your book gives you an example and says, um, if I have negative three to the negative two, well, your book is explaining to you that that means that this flips to the denominator. So what would be left is just one in the numerator. You never turn it to zero because that would make the value nothing. So uh, even when this flips, it would still leave a one here. Anything times one is still itself. So one stays. And then this would become negative three. The negative is the base. Only the negative exponent becomes positive by flipping it. The value does not change, just its position. So negative three times negative three is positive nine. So my answer is one over nine. And your book shows you that on page 122. Now they give you some examples with lots of exponents, positive and negative, and they want you to solve those. So let's practice a few. You've got quite a few practice on page 124. So everybody join me there, and I think the more that you do it, the more sense it will make. So especially if negative exponents is something you didn't get to, um, didn't get practice in in pre-algebra, this is a fun algebra concept as we're starting out today. So it says um, simplify. So letter A, I've got 1 over 2 to the negative 3. So remember, I should not have negative exponents, and the negative is whatever base it's touching. So this whole thing needs to flip up to the numerator, so it would be 2 cubed. And it became positive by flipping up to the numerator. Now, 1 would stay in the denominator because you can just imagine that this was times one, any number by itself. So when this flips up, one still stays there, or it's a whole number, right? Because anything over one is a whole number. So your final answer would be two cubed, which is two times two times two. I have three of them. So my final answer is eight. All right, and calculators are so smart now that you can actually plug it in this way and it will come out this way but I do want you to be able to solve these without because you're getting ready to have some variables. Now let's take a look at letter B. Letter B says negative four to the negative two. And 
Keep in mind that that's understood over one and this would all be times an understood one. So only this is getting moved because that is the only negative exponent. So I still have one in the numerator because I can multiply one times any number and it still be itself, right? But that would make this become negative four squared. So one still stays in the numerator, but negative four times negative four makes positive 16. So this is my answer, one over 16. Now, letter C, they show the negative three is in the denominator and it's raised to the negative two. So that's gonna have to flip from the denominator up to the numerator. So I'm not gonna do letter C, but I would encourage you to, to work that at home. All right, letter D and, um, well actually, D, E, and F all look similar. And I know your brain's gonna want to say, anything raised to the zero power is one. So I want us to be extra cautious about these three. So let's talk about them and make sure we understand the difference. So G raised to the zero power is one, right? But E says, oh, this is D, I'm sorry, letter D. So letter E says negative eight raised to the zero. Now be careful because your mind just wants to go, well, it's one as well, and it would be. It would be one if it were eight to the zero power is one, or negative eight in parentheses to the zero power would be one. But the way that this is written would be negative one times eight to the zero power. So it is negative one. So letter E is negative one because there is no parentheses around it. So be on the lookout for that. Now F is negative three and it is in parentheses to the zero power. So I know you know the answer to that one, right? Now let's take a look at letter G. It has P plus M plus K squared and all of it is raised to the zero power. So all of it is added together and then all of it is raised to the zero power. So what would letter G be? Any base raised to the zero power is one. So letter G is also one. Now let's uh, look at H. Wowzers, H has a lot of exponents, doesn't it friends? All right, let's take a look. All right, so I've got x to the negative three, y to the negative eight, y to the fifth, x to the fourth, z, and then x squared, z to the fifth. All right, so I've got two, four, six, seven two, four, six, seven. Okay, I wanted to make sure I didn't skip anything. All right, so I've got a whole bunch of different bases, but some of them are the same, so I wanna make sure that I get it correctly. So, we remember that exponents are that long lost friend that's one step behind the curve, right? So, let's uh, start by just getting the bases that are the same. I've got x, x, and x. So I've got x negative three, x to the fourth, x squared. All my bases are the same, so when my bases are the same, I just add them together. Negative three plus four plus two. So uh, if I have um, negative three plus four, now I have one. One plus two is three. So x cubed is how I've worked all that out. And I'm going to go ahead and mark them out so I don't get confused as to what I've done, right? Now I've got y to the negative eight, y to the fifth. So, y to the negative eight, y to the fifth. So, it would be y negative eight plus five. So, I owe more than I have, so it would be y to the negative three, right? I'm gonna mark those out, and what do I have left? z, and then z to the fifth. Well, if there is nothing written, it's an understood one. So, it would be z one plus five which is z to the sixth. Now, I would be done if they were all, so you all see this is all one term. So all I've done is gather the same bases together 
and I followed my exponent rule. If I'm multiplying the step before as I add my exponents. Now the difference that I, I, I can't just stop here is what we've learned in this lesson. Negative exponents need to switch. So all of this is over one. So this is the only negative. You only move the negative. You know, that's a good value in our own life. Only move the negative. If you've got uh, positive influences, keep those. But, but um, negative influences are not good in anyone's life. So I'm just moving those negative. I'm flipping them to the opposite side. So that would make it the denominator. So my final answer, x cubed, z to the sixth. Those are not the same basis, so I cannot combine them over y cubed. Notice the negative didn't make my value negative. It changed its position. So that's it. That's my final answer. And I'm finished with letter H. And wow, it was huge, wasn't it? Now I'm going to let you do um, I because I is much smaller compared to what we just did in H. Now J says use the distributive property to expand it, to solve it, and to simplify, right? All right, so uh, let's uh, erase this. And we will distribute, and it looks like we're distributing some, some fun things. So it's 2x to the negative 2y cubed. And then inside my parentheses, I've got x squared y. And then minus 3x negative 1, y negative 3. So I'm taking this and I'm distributing it or multiplying it to both. So my coefficient here is an understood one. One times two is two. Now I've got x negative two and x two, so I would add them together. Negative two plus two cancels out, so that would make it zero. So x to the zero power would be two times one right? Now I've got y, and it's y3 plus 1, which would be y to the fourth. Now you can keep that one there, or you just know, or we'll just write y to the fourth, so so far we've got 2y to the fourth, right? That's our whole first, because negative 2 plus 2 made 0, and 0 Anything to the zero power is one, two times one is two. So I don't need to even include. It's kind of like the X's just cancel out. You can just mark it out. Two Y to the fourth, because I have three plus one. I can write that here. All right, now I'm gonna bring down my minus sign. Two times three is six. Those are my coefficients. And then I've got X negative two plus negative one. So, that would make negative six x to the negative three, right? Now I've got y three minus three. So that would be y to the zero, which we know is one, anything times one, I can just mark it out, right? But I can't leave it this way, so I'm gonna have to say minus six, and this flips down x cubed. So my final answer, minus six x cubed, right? Because the x was negative, it flipped to the denominator. There was no y, three minus three made zero, and um, one times six would still be six. So this is my final answer on letter j, all right? Um, so that's the last in lesson 29 that you're solving there for your negative exponents and raising to the zero power. Now we're looking at lesson 30. We've got two more lessons to cover. Your algebraic phrases. And I would encourage you on page 125, really spend time reading through those because it's important that you understand what of means, what a product um, what the difference means. And when you read story problems that you're having to convert those problems to those terms are super important. So don't just jump right into your lesson. Spend some time reading through that table and solving them. So let's look at lesson 30. So I'm going to erase this. And lesson 30 is just teaching us to spend some time with our terms. 
And you know, in, in my experience of teaching, it seems like the most intimidated that students are is by written problems where it doesn't set up the problem for them and they have to take the words and convert it to set up a problem. Sometimes that's intimidating for us. So if we learn the proper terminology, it's gonna make solving those problems so much easier. Now let's look at page 126. It says, in practice A through D, write the algebraic phrases that correspond with the word phrases. Five times the sum. So uh, uh, letter A, I'm doing five times and sum means to add. So five times whatever this sum is. Five times the sum of three times a number, so that'd be three X and negative five. So it set it up for us. Five times the sum of three times a number, that's our, we used X, and negative five. All right, that's letter A. All right, letter B. Letter B says the product. Well, product means multiply. The product of three and the sum. So three times whatever this sum is. So uh, the product of three and the sum of a number and negative 50. So it's saying the product of this and this multiplied together, but you first have to find the sum of this. So product of three and the sum of a number and negative 50. All right, letter D, three times the sum. So uh, letter C, I'm sorry. No, I said D, I'm sorry. I skipped C, didn't I? So the sum of five uh, times a number, sum just means add. So in that case, uh, C is uh, a lot easier than D. So let's jump right to D. Three times the sum. So three times the sum of the opposite of a number and negative seven. So three times the sum, so we're adding it together, the opposite of a number. So that'd be negative X. We don't know what the number is. Opposite of a number would be negative X and negative seven. So three times this sum, very important. All right, now um, E says, Letter E says 0.16 of what number? Of means multiply, of X is 10.24. Do you see how when I just take what they give me and then rewrite it in an algebraic, uh, I can actually solve it. So um, it tells us in E through G to actually solve those. So I'm just getting the, the variable by itself since it's being multiplied. I'm gonna divide by 0.16. And you can do that at home with your calculators. So X equals 0.16 uh, divided into 10.24. So just grab your calculators and type in 10.24 and divide it by six, uh, 0.16. And you'll be able to, to solve that. Letter F, what decimal part of 80 is 60? So you're just gonna write X, uh, of means multiply, so X times 80 is 60. So again, I'm setting these up the same as I did the fractional parts. It's just this time we're working with decimal parts. So I'm getting my variable by itself since it said of is multiply. This time I'm going to divide, right? So X equals, now if it were asking for the fractional part, I could divide both by 10 and get 6 over 8 and then reduce X if I divide um, by 2 that would be three-fourths. But it didn't ask for fractional part, it asked what decimal part. So if you remember quarters, you remember that X equals 0.75. Now, um, you could easily just take your calculator and do 60 divided by 80 is 0.75. So um, I just wanted to show the conversion there. All right, so letter G, 0.48 of eight is what number? Well, you've already got the variable by itself. Of means multiply. And then um, what number is whatever variable you choose. I go with X most of the time, but uh, you're welcome to choose a different variable if you prefer. But um, all you have to do there is multiply because your variable's already by itself, so just do what it says. So you're just taking the number eight and multiplying it times 
0.48. So I hope this is an encouragement to you. Sometimes when you feel intimidated reading those things, just rewrite it in a math sentence and learning what those terms mean. Sum, add, product, multiply. Um, those, uh, the opposite of a number. It, it's just negative, whatever that number is or, or a variable there. So don't let those things intimidate you. Um, really spend some time looking over what that means. Now, lesson 31 is the last lesson we're covering this week. And lesson 31 is all about uh, parentheses. And we remember our order of operation. Um, please, parentheses always get to come first. So we're looking at lesson 31. And um, we're talking about parentheses. So we can distribute as needed. And um, we can also um, simplify as needed. So your book is encouraging you, when you see a problem with parentheses, try to simplify if possible, if not distribute, because your end goal is to eliminate those parentheses so that you can solve using order of operations. So let's take a look at our practice problems on page 130. And I would encourage you to take time to read through the examples on 128 and 129. You're welcome to even pause this video as you look through. There's a lot of bold face examples there. All right, so let's take a look at practice A. So practice A has negative 3 parentheses 2 minus C equals C minus 2. All right, so uh, we're solving this and I've got variables on both sides. So where my parentheses is, I cannot um, combine 2 minus C because uh, they're not like terms, but I can distribute the negative 3 to both sides. So I've got negative 3 times 2 is negative 6. Now be careful because I've got minus C times negative 3. So minus times minus makes it plus 3C. And be very careful with that. Excuse me, that's Sadie joining us in our video. All right, so a negative times a negative makes positive 3C. And that's the most common mistake I see algebra students make is they forget to watch those signs. They just see the negative and they bring it here, but they forgot that I had negative C to begin with. So I'm multiplying a negative times the opposite of C would make it positive 3C equals, and I'm just gonna bring down C minus two. Now I always want to get my variables together. Now I've seen students try to move the numbers first, but in upper level algebra, sometimes the variables can cancel. And if that does, you have to look at whether the statement is true or false. If the statement is true, it means you can plug in any number for the variable. So you always should move your variables first to test to see if the variables cancel out. So I'm gonna move this, so I'm gonna put minus C, or it's the same thing as minus one C. It means the same. So that's gonna cancel out and leave me with only negative two on this side, but three C minus one C is two C. Don't forget to bring down your negative six and I had positive 2C left. Now, my goal is to get the variable by itself. I always think of him as the bad guy, right? And he's got a bodyguard with him because they're being multiplied. So I'm going to add 6 to get all the clues on the same side, right? So I bring down 2C is left on this side. We canceled out the 6. And I'm left with, I owe 2, I have 6, so therefore I have 4. I'm going to get my C by itself divide by 2. So C equals two. And I can always go back in and solve to verify. And I can even go back to this line. If I say two times two is four, four plus negative six is negative two. So we did confirm and make sure that that was correct. So great job. All right, uh, there are uh, two more to solve. So let's skip B and go to the last one, letter C. So we did A, we're skipping B, so you can solve that one at home. And let's take a look at letter C. Now be very careful because that has a negative on the outside. Negative seven minus nine parentheses Z. So that means the negative and the Z is going to both of them. So be on the lookout for that. Minus six Z equals eight parentheses negative six uh, plus two. Now, this one is interesting because they are just numbers, so I can simplify this. So negative six plus two would be negative four. That made that one a lot easier to solve. Now, 
Uh, actually, this is numbers as well. So 7 minus 9 is negative 2. So neither parentheses had um, uncombinable terms. They were both um, whole numbers, so I can easily solve those. So if I say a negative times a negative, that makes positive 2z minus 6z equals 8 times negative 4, negative 32. Now, these are both like terms, and they're on the same side, so just do what it says. I have 2z, I owe 6z, so I owe more than I have. So I subtract the numbers, and I have negative 4z equals negative 32. Now, I've got to get the bad guy by himself. He's being multiplied by negative 4, inverse, divide by negative 4. So what am I left with? z equals 8. All right, and always verify to check. So it's very important to go back in. So 8 times negative 4 is negative 32. So that's very important. And you can go back up to your beginning line as well to check. So um, I hope that this uh, week is an encouragement to you in algebra. It's some new concepts, especially with those negative exponents. But don't let them intimidate you because they're a lot of fun deciding whether to move it to the numerator or to the denominator. But don't think that the value is negative, just the position. I'm looking forward to seeing you back next week. Um, God bless you and have a great week enjoying your Algebra 1. Thanks.